Okay, so good morning, everybody. <coughs> and uh, today we are going to start the second part of the course that will take us through the next eight weeks, basically, about uh, learning uh, uh, the, the, the key points about uh, the React framework. And I also want to mention that uh, this week uh, we are going to start the lab activities with the big labs. So in the between today and tomorrow, we are going to publish some uh, information about uh, how to work with, with the, the big labs. Uh, there will be one uh, document that will tell you how to use the uh, classroom, GitHub Classroom platform in order to define your group uh, composition and uh, get a, um, a repository, a private repository you, you, you may work in. Okay. So uh, you get the instruction to be followed the first time, just to you know, uh, create the group. And then you will have a repository, uh, which is private to your group. So all the members of the group will have access to the repository and also the teachers will have. Uh, the big lab will be uh, organized in uh, four weeks, four consecutive weeks, A, B, C, D, uh, four different steps. At the beginning, we'll give you, uh, um, what is that? An idea of the general goal, of, of, and you can also already guess that uh, we are going to rebuild uh, the uh, movie libraries uh, uh, using React. And uh, uh, so we, we already have uh, know the general goal of the first uh, big lab, of the first four weeks. Uh, and, but then every week uh, we'll give you a more detailed uh, uh, instruction for the first week, 1A, second week, 1B, and so on. Okay. So you'll have one general instruction for logging in, one uh, general specification of the whole application, and then uh, every week uh, the, the steps uh, that you should uh, accomplish every week. The submission will be only at the end. Okay, so uh, you, we divided the work in four weeks, uh, basically to make you, not, uh, to, to help you uh, organize the work, uh, but uh, there's no submission every week. Okay, you should probably commit and push your work for yourselves for working together, but uh, it's not that, that we will not. We are not going to look or to check your code until the end of the four weeks. Okay, at the end of the four weeks, uh, you will have some more days after the last lab to do the final submission with the procedure on GitHub. Basically, you need to push uh, with a, with a tag called the final, and so we can we may check uh, the work. And at that point, we will start the second big lab. We will be organized in the same way, four weeks uh, with a general goal and uh, going forward from, from uh, big lab one. So the second big lab will be the continuation of the first one. Basically, in the first one, we are going only to work on the client side. And the second one, we also integrate the client server architecture into the, into the application. OK, so just uh keep an eye on on slack and on the website so that you can uh, have this information and uh, start looking at the specification of the work uh, that uh, we are going to start on thursday okay so apart from that uh, let's just check some levels yeah um today we are going to start uh, uh this react very, very famous no, react framework uh, and see that uh, uh, well, uh, we will learn a way of looking at the web application which is far, uh, very far from uh, the impression we got last week. So last week, basically, I had the impression that we were fighting against the DOM, okay? Trying to find the ways of, of exploiting DOM properties uh, in order to uh, try to add something or modify something or find an element somewhere, okay? And uh, it was quite a, a low level work. And if you had a lot of stuff going on in a single web page, uh, you will have to manage manually with a lot of event handlers, asynchronous event handlers, all the different interaction of the different uh, um, 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 sequences uh, or dependencies of the different uh, operations. React takes a totally different approach. Okay. Um, we are learning that uh, because one of the two or three major frameworks uh, today um, on, the, on, the, on the landscape, on the web landscape, uh, is not the only one. Uh, the idea here is that uh, with the knowledge that 
ground knowledge that we already have on JavaScript, it would be easy to learn any new framework. Let's start, we'll see only this one, but uh, you know that if tomorrow you need a, a different one, you will have the, already the basis for understanding that, okay? Um, basically, all these frameworks give you a simplified programming model, but of course, a good uh, uh, understanding of JavaScript will help you understand what is happening really under the hood. And we are, well, maybe lucky, maybe not, that the newest version of React, version 18, was just published on March 29. So we are riding actually the, the newest version. This is good because, okay, it's uh, well in sync with our course. Uh, that it all, will also bear some risks uh, because, of course, maybe it's uh, something will not, uh, uh, and we'll see, we'll see in a moment uh, there will be a warning that it's supposed to go away when all the uh, dependent packages are being uh, updated, but right now we are still in a small transitioning phase. It's a stable version, so we are not writing on, on alpha version or whatever, but uh, um, uh, just just be aware that we are uh, on, on, the he on the edge of the latest versions. Mm -hmm. It would be very difficult to work with our previous version because all the automated tools are always try to pull uh, the latest one. Okay. Um, why do we need a framework? Uh, because we don't want to fight with JavaScript and with the DOM every time. That's uh, probably the, the, the easiest and most comprehensive uh, um, answer, so that we can work and think and develop at a higher level of abstraction than the individual DOM node uh, with the, all the legacy that the DOM has uh, or in terms of uh, the kind of attributes, in terms of uh, the kind of nodes that we have and so on. Mm -hmm. And so we have a, a sort of a simplified view of the DOM. We are seeing the web page in a way that Okay, it's more understandable. It has less uh, uh, special cases uh, than all the different uh, uh, DOM nodes. And also, uh, we have a, a, a more a cleaner and different programming uh, paradigm, programming style. Uh, right now, you know, in, in JavaScript, we have, okay, we know that the JavaScript should be a mostly used in a functional and asynchronous way, but we are also writing a lot of sequential code. And so it's not just up to us you not know, to, to choose the, the programming style. With a framework, we usually tend to adopt the style that is not imposed, but strongly suggested by the framework. We need to follow some additional rules. Okay, the fr framework wants to, wants to play nice with you if you play nice with the framework. So we have extra rules to follow so that uh, the framework will help us uh, um, so reaching the results uh, in an easier way. The, the rule also, uh, here is uh, don't fight the framework. Okay? If there is something that you want to do in a way and you see that it's difficult, don't try to uh, find workarounds uh, because probably <clears throat> there will be a, a different way of doing the same thing within the logic, within the thinking of the framework. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and especially about the state management, uh, and the uh, event management, uh, uh, there are there will be very strict rules uh, that in the end will uh, simplify a lot of our, our work. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we want to learn React, uh, there is no better starting point than the official documentation. Um, we have on this React.js website, which is here, basically opened here before, mm -hmm. we have a very, uh, say, ample and wide documentation section uh, with the definition of the concept we will mostly follow this order more or less and uh, uh, with the different concepts described in sequence or with tutorials uh, where you may you know and in a handsome way uh, try the different uh, um, features uh, of, of react uh, but it's also worth mention that uh, all the whole documentation is being redone in a much cleaner and much deeper way in this website, uh, betareactjs.org. So they are rebuilding all the documentation from scratch. And I can say that the new documentation is very good. Uh, the only problem is that it's still incomplete. So some information is not there yet. But for the information which is already there, it's much simpler, much cleaner, much more modern because um, it's, uh, it's being rewritten right now. So this year or last year, so they started only last year to, to uh, redraw it. And they also are trying to, after years of experience, uh, they know which uh, 
pat which programming patterns work better and are more suitable so they also give you some suggest more practical suggestion okay and uh, um, on the say on the modern features of react while the official documentation is still a bit say old it's uh, okay it's updated of course to the features of react but the um, the way they explain things and the way they propose you to do things uh, is a bit uh, uh, okay it's uh, the old way of doing stuff we will see in a moment uh, what it means hmm? okay of course there are also books if you want uh, some real books or some open <laughs> say, um, free books uh, that are available online there's really a lot of, docu of documentation there are uh, two official uh, browser exp extensions uh, called the react developer tools uh, one for chrome and the other for firefox uh, so uh, the, that will extend the functionalities of the um, developer tools inside the browsers with a new tab uh, which uh, uh, we can use to inspect uh, actually the React components. Hmm? And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see how it works. So that's the ecosystem. How do we think uh, in React? Um, React is, uh, I, I can summarize that in, the, in two keywords. It's declarative and functional. Uh, declarative means that uh, we, are, we tend to describe how we want the, the, the interface to look like. Okay? So we are, uh, we, um, in a given point in time, we want to describe what is the content of a, of a web page. We are, not, uh, we are trying not to describe how to modify or to, how to manipulate the, the uh, single elements of the page so uh, while uh, normally you would think about the transitions so the, the pages are given context i need to change it element i need to add that element i need to manage this animation or add this content oh, in traditional javascript programming in react we are thinking okay right now the page has this content and since some information has changed now the new page will have or the same page will have a different content. So you focus on the result and not on how to reach the result. That will be the, uh, the work of the framework to modify, transform the page from a first content to a second content, from an initial to a modified content. Mm -hmm. uh, we only define how each part of the page is going to render itself. Uh, this concept of rendering is bound to the concept of, of, of components. So we are not describing the web page in terms of DOM nodes or HTML tags, but we may define our own high-level components. And every component knows how to render itself. So if it's, if it's a table, it knows that it should output the table tag and then the rows and then the content of the rows and so on. But once we define our component works, we can just reuse this component many times. And it's up to the component uh, to update its own rendering if some information changes. Hmm? So we are breaking down the page in a set of high-level components that will be nested and combined together. It will be parametric components. Uh, and they know when to render. Rendering means transforming themselves into HTML, basically. Um, but uh, we are not controlling explicitly when they do render. That will be the framework scheduling the different operations. Okay? And uh, for having a sequence of components uh, updating themselves in a, say, random order, or uh, in an order which is not controlled by us, it's not a sequential order, we, sh we should have, of course, uh, stricter, stricter rules about uh, how these components will compute themselves, will render themselves. And in particular, all components are just functions and should be pure functions so that uh, they only depend uh, on the input that they receive. And if a pure function doesn't uh, create any side effect and doesn't access any external information, then we are sure that this function can be called in any order. Or, many, or how many times uh, we need. And every time we call a function, it will give me the same result if the input parameters are the same. Okay? 
So we are forced to create uh, components as really pure functions with no side effects and we know uh, outside information. And that will enable the, the, the framework uh, to call these functions in order to reconstruct the parts of the pages that are needed. So we are trusting the framework to do a lot of work uh, while we do our part of describing the content of the page as a set of nested components. This is the view that we have from now on. A web page will, is a set of uh, nested components. Every component is just a JavaScript function. Nothing more than a function. Okay, this function uh, is uh, uh, has a, has the goal, has just one goal of creating a fragment of the user interface. A component will create one sidebar, one form, one table, uh, a list of items, or whatever. Imagine a part, different parts of the page are, are, have different contents, and every part will be generated by a different component, which only needs uh, to, um, to care and to focus about that part of the page. <clears throat> In general, the content of a portion of the or a fragment of the page only depends on two objects, two sets of information, state and properties. Props is a shortcut from properties in the all React uh, speak, uh, speaking. Okay? Uh, properties are the inputs to the component. So a component may have some, of course, any function may have some input parameters. And these are called properties in, in React speak. So in function speak, we say a function has a, let, a list of arguments. In React, we are saying that a component receives a set of properties, which are just input parameters. Okay? And the, the component should render its own interface only by looking at the um, properties that it receives. This is true for the mo vast majority of components. Then there are some components that need the, to have an internal state. Maybe uh, a toggle button that may be selected or deselected. And the knowledge whether it's selected or not uh, lies within the component. And so it should uh, be rendered in a different way according to the selection state. So in a way, this function should remember something about its internal state. So um, some components also have some state information, which is strictly managed. So it's not any global variable that we, we can access and modify. It's strictly managed within the framework rules. Uh, um, and there's a strict visibility rules uh, and strict uh, updating rules for this state. Okay, so these are functions that may possess, may remember some part of state uh, managed with a specific uh, function call. Mm -hmm. We we'll see. We we'll discuss about state uh, next week. Best. Um, but for a given value of the state and for a given value of the uh, properties, uh, the component should assume that properties and state are con like constant values and should always produce the same output fragment with the same input values. Okay, so if I bring a component with the same state as it was before and I pass it the same properties, I should guarantee that uh, uh, the function will return exactly the same result. And this result will be a fragment of HTML, basically. Um, so inside the component, all the properties are read-only, and the state is to be treated as a read-only variable, except when we want to change it, there are some function calls that will schedule an asynchronous change to the state. So we are scheduling a state change. It means that locally, we cannot modify it. It's just something that we can use, uh, and if we need to change it, we can ask the framework to change it afterwards. But first, we need to render the current version of the component, and we ask the framework, okay, but then we need to change it. Mm -hmm. So this all uh, managed. So with these uh, notions, both property and state uh, in the execution of a function are to be treated as constants, 
And that's, that is what makes the function pure. So that the function only has access to some properties, to some states that ca they can modify. They can be modified. They are read only. They are tr to be treated as immutable. It, the function cannot access any external, should not access any external information. Therefore, if I call the function three times in a row, it will always give me the same result. And by the way, during the in development mode, React is actively checking this property. So whenever, not whenever, not always, but uh, very often when React is trying to render a component, it calls my function twice in, the, in development mode, of course, not in production mode, and it will check that the results, the output is the same. Other, otherwise, they, they will warn me, beware, your component is not pure, and so you have some problems. And uh, in, uh, so you will see that many times it, that some, <laughs> some output is uh, generated twice. Uh, we just, we, and this is because you know, React is trying to protect ourselves from, uh, since that there's no say, st strict syntax in JavaScript for guaranteeing that functions are pure, React is trying to, to check whether we are not uh, doing any um, programming mistakes. And so our goal is just to design the components uh, and uh, the application will uh, be rendered, this is the word, uh, every time something changes. Um, the idea of React is that we describe a page as a, as a set of components, as we said, and every time something changes, every time a property changes, and we'll see how they could change, or every time a state variable changes, all the page is rebuilt, is reconstructed. This is our mental model. Okay, so imagine you have a, 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 some code for generating a page. You change a bit, uh, you if I modify a checkbox, or you type a key in a in a text box, uh, and you are rebuilding the whole page. Just uh, ideally, okay. Uh, so this is a very clean model. You are changing something in the inputs, uh, and you are recomputing everything. And you are recomputing by calling functions that may, have, may not have any memory or any side effect from the previous iteration. So you know exactly what you are reconstructing. You, are, you don't have the risk of forgetting to update something because you are not updating. You are rebuilding from scratch, ideally. Of course, from the, for the, from the performance point of view, it doesn't work like this. What, is happens, what happens is that React knows which components need updating and only calls the update on those. And even that, uh, the component will generate uh, some shadow representation of the DOM. They are not generating the real DOM. And uh, React uh, will try to match the new version of the DOM generated by the component uh, with the actual version of the DOM of the page. And will the only apply will do a diff basically of the two DOMs, the two trees, and will actually modify the real DOM only when actual changes happen. So if I'm rendering a component, changing some input, re-rendering re from scratch the same component, and the, same, the new rendering only has one line more of text, we are. I am actually rebuilding that, uh, but the browser will only see the addition of the, uh, the line. We are not really rebuilding the page. So there's a very clever um, difference checking algorithm inside React uh, that will uh, try to minimize the, the only real expensive operation here, which is updating the DOM in the browser. Because every time I touch the DOM, or the browser will refresh the page, will add the element. Everything else is just inside the internal data structures. So it's very fast. It's just creating a tree of nodes, uh, creating some objects, and so on. And then we throw it away. So we trust in React to know which components need to be updated and to do the best for, to minimize the performance impact of rebuilding some part of the page. So we can stick with our very simplified model where we can we may think the page is redrawn from scratch every time. So we need to start focusing or to think in a state-based model. With these input values, what should be the output? Okay. 
it would be difficult to fit in this model the actions of the user because the action is that transition and the react is uh, static and, and declarative we'll see that of course how how, how it fits mm -hmm. but first let's be let's be uh, clear on the general model so basically well, this is just a picture that uh, explains that uh, uh, react is going to recreate from scratch this sort of virtual dom which is an internal data structure and only computing the differences and modify the real dom nodes that of course uh, live in the browser only where, when there are modifications but this is not something that we should be aware of, should care of. there are also other simpli uh, simplified uh, uh, say versions so we have a simplified notion of the dom we also have a simplified notion of the events of the browser we didn't dig uh, too much on the events uh, last week, uh, but uh, uh, if we start especially working with forms uh, with, uh, in HTML, there's a lot of details and quirks uh, because every component, every form element behaves in a slightly different ways, uh, way just to make uh, uh, our lives uh, funnier. But uh, in this case, in React, uh, they are redefining the events. So we are, we are going to work with ev events that are similar to the DOM ones, uh, but are more regular in structure that are more easy to handle and uh, to understand. Hmm? And it also deals with all the browser incompatibilities or something like that. So the logic is very similar to what we have with the DOM, but we will never really touch the real DOM. We know it's there, but will be managed only by the library, only by the framework. We, what we see is a better version of the DOM itself. From the uh, point of view of the code, a uh, React application starts uh, with, a, with a call of a function, which is called render. All this rendering process, what does it do? It uh, takes one part of a page, what is called a container node. So imagine you have an HTML page, okay? You pick one node, it would be a div, for example, and say, okay, this part of the, or could be also the body, but normally we, we choose an internal div. And we say, okay, this div will contain my application. This means that we are going to render a component inside that container. The container is still a DOM node, an old style DOM node. We will render a component inside that node. And usually that component will be you know, the application component that will in turn contain other 95 components. All of them will be inserted into that element. And this is an example of a component. It's in particular, it's a very old style component. It's just a React element uh, consisting of a H1 code. This syntax is a bit strange because it seems to mix a JavaScript code with HTML code in the same, there's no quotes here. It's not a string. It's a syntax which is called JSX, which is very useful, and uh, we get familiar with that. It's just a shortcut for writing uh, in a, with an HTML-like syntax a set of uh, objects uh, constructed. But everything works with this render that creates uh, um, so expands these components into real nodes and mounts these nodes into the container. And from this moment on, the application is will be managing this set of components. Hmm? Uh, in uh, version 18, this code is slightly different, but uh, the, the old version is still supported. So uh, there will be one transition because right now the tools for creating a new project are still generating this code, uh, which is, is, is valid until the version 17, and is still supported in version 18, but the new suggested st uh, structure in, from version 18 will be this one. So probably in the, in the next weeks, uh, there will be an up, an up, a minor update to some uh, uh, external tool that we use to create new projects uh, that will also update this. Okay. That's, uh, uh, pull request uh, the, which is being evaluated by the um, by the React team, and so we expect uh, in a few days or weeks uh, um, to to transition from this from the previous version to the second one. We shouldn't care too much. So the the logic is the same. 
we are selecting one container node and we are defining which component uh, or element uh, in this case we'll see the, the difference in a moment uh, will go into that container we are just using the, some create root instead of uh, uh, of having just a, an element in the render method just a detail okay we, we will get a warning for that but uh, uh, we shouldn't care too much about the difference it doesn't make any difference to us we only do this call once in the main component call so usually this render call here on the root components or render on the react dom class uh, will be just in the in the skeleton of the project uh, but inside our components we don't we don't we don't need it hmm? it's just a starting point and uh, what about this uh, HTML into JavaScript. Uh, thanks to a set of translators that are normally pre-configured in, uh, in a React project, uh, we may use a, a syntax which is similar to HTML, which is called JSX, uh, inside a, a, any point, any, any expression inside our JavaScript code. So when we are writing expression, we can also open you know, a tag and start writing there with some uh, warnings on the syntax uh, that you will see. And what happens is actually, this is translated by the Babel tool with a set of rules uh, while we are let's say, running the application. On the fly, this code will be translated into a set of calls uh, to some uh, internal components uh, or user-defined components uh, in React. So when you write in div, actually what, what we are executing is the creation of a div node from the DOM library with some property id equal to test, and this property is taken from the attribute of the div tag. So all this translation is uh, transparent to us. We need to be aware that then we are, when we are writing this, we are just re really writing JavaScript code to create a set of nested objects. Okay, the first parameter is a set of properties, the second parameter is a set of uh, uh, ch children uh, to be added to the, to the parent node. Instead of writing all this code or creating nested objects with the braces inside braces inside braces, we have the, this much cleaner uh, syntax uh, that will be translated to JavaScript. So it's nothing new, it's just a, a shortcut for writing a set of uh, function calls for creating nested objects. And the view of the page we have is uh, something like this. Uh, we want to recreate a complete web page as a set of nested components. What we call the React application is just the, the top-level component the outermost container. It will it may generate some HTML code, or it may include some other components that will be described in their own functions that will be responsible for generating one part of the page and so on. So normally, we have a, a, a deeply nested uh, tree of components, uh, and React will encourage us to break down the interface in many little components. Uh, not uh, one big one that will manage half of the page, but breaking down into smaller components so that we can reuse the functionalities of the different parts of the page. Since these components are functions, may receive parameter, parameters, may be intelligent inside, so it would be very easy to create a component that may be used uh, in similar ways, also in different parts of the page. So we have a lot of components, which are just a lot of functions, that we'll call, indirectly, we'll call each other. Okay. And then there is one big call at the beginning of the render method that will start uh, creating all these three. Mm -hmm. And the render will be only at the top level component and the others will be managed automatically. So uh, the idea when the creating a component in React is very simple. You just define a function. The name of, fun of the function will be the name of the component. And as a function, it should return a value. And this value should be the 
elements or the components that are com uh, say um, correspond to the content of the component in the current state. So a blog post excerpt will expand into a div containing h1, a, a p, and a div. In this case, the content of the component are just plain or look like a plain HTML nodes. Actually, this is not, they are not really DOM nodes because React is still adding some details on that, but it's not. Uh, um, or, in, or may also contain the calls, the reference to other components. Okay, but the, uh, every component just has this structure. Name that defines a function that returns uh, at a part of the tree of, of code. Of course, uh, uh, before returning, maybe the function may be some computations there, maybe to customize the result. In the right hand part of, of, of the slides, in a dimmed, uh, say, color, uh, I reported uh, uh, another way of declaring component, which is using classes instead of functions. This was the original way. So the first versions of React uh, asked you to define a component as a class uh, with a render method that will return exactly the same code. Then during the years, they found a way to simplify all the syntax and just make it a simple function. So nowadays, everybody is using functions instead of classes. That's why we are not going to look at the classes. If you look at the official documentation, this is where I feel that the documentation is, is, is old. Uh, you will see that they will describe classes first and then tell you, oh, you may also use functions. Uh, today, we are actually starting from the other part. So. Components uh, usually, or you may write anything you want inside the function, but normally we can think of components as uh, components that, that do actually generate DOM nodes, do actually generate content in the page, or components that are just containers hmm? that don't generate any real DOM, any real HTML, but they are there for managing maybe the state or the property for a group of children components. So they are just intermediate in order to you know, organize the flow of data, flow of information. We'll talk about this flow of information, uh, say, next week when we deal about the state. Um, so normally, we, the, this concept of state will be split uh, between the internal state of a component, just the state information the component needs for itself, separated from the application state. So information that maybe mostly com most components or many components need to know. And so this information should be passed around through across the different components. Mm -hmm. um, how do we how do these components communicate with each other? They communicate in the only possible way for a function, for a pure function, through the properties, through the, para through the function parameters. So it's normal for a component uh, to include, uh, to, in this rendered function, to call or include other components and passing some properties to these other components that will be computed or copied from the properties that are received in the top of the component. So there is a flow from top to bottom, from the application to the nodes, of information in the form of properties that are passed, uh, being passed down. So the data flow is always from top to bottom. Even when we add a state, uh, well, we, may, we may have some state in this component, but this state is not visible by any other component. So if you want a lower level component to know something about the state of a higher level component, uh, this information must be passed through the properties as in form of a property, in form of a parameter, until the node needs to use it. Data flow is always in React top to bottom. Don't try to play tricks. If you need to modify, if a lower level component needs in a way you know, to communicate with a higher level component, imagine here we have some state of the application, maybe the language. 
The application is currently shown in, in, in Italian. We want to switch to English. But the button for switching is down here. This will be the button that you need to press to change language. So this component here knows that uh, some information belonging to that, comp that orange component up there needs to be changed. But uh, we cannot change data or information upwards, only downwards. So what we will do, it will be strange at the beginning, but then we get familiar with that, is that if this component wants its children to be able to change some of its internal state, this component will pass some callback functions down to the components so that this component down there will be able to call a callback function defined in the higher component. And so the code will execute in the context of the right component uh, and will change the information that we need. Hmm? So uh, the idea is that I own my own information. If I can instantiate children components, I can transmit to my children components some information, some data, in the form of some properties, or I can give some functions to my children, and the children may be able to call these functions, and this function will change my state. So if I want to enable you to change some information that I own, I give you a function that you may call to change state. So I have full control of what you can do on my state because you can only call the function that I give you, the callbacks that I give you, to modify my own state. And these functions, of course, in JavaScript, they are just data. They will be passed down as properties as we all do at the data. So we distinguish between data values and callback functions, but the mechanism is always top to bottom in this way. And this trick allows a lower level component to, in, you know, in a way, interact with the higher level component through the call of the function that are being passed down. Okay, so this aspect is probably the, the only complex aspect uh, that we are uh, going to, to, to study next week. Mm -hmm. So right now, we have this uh, generic concept of a state, uh, but we are not expanding on it uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, and also this. Okay, so let's go practical. Um, to create a, a React application, okay, do we only have to call the render method there? And we need to import all the required libraries. And we need to configure the Babel translator in order to translate JSX into, um, into regular JavaScript. So there's a lot of uh, scaffolding to do. There's a lot of packages to install and configure and so on. Um, and usually we don't create uh, React uh, projects uh, from scratch, from an empty directory. Hmm? There is a, a, a tool which is called uh, Create React App that will uh, configure uh, an empty project for us. Okay, so creating a new uh, project is just a matter of uh, these four or five instructions. Uh, let's do that. So in our uh, repository uh, week six, uh, or this week, uh, we may create uh, a new project, just maybe for, for trying, with this command, npx, uh, MPX, sorry. MPX is a sort of a, um, is a command of the npm package. Instead of in npm, will be we are used the, we already used that for for uh, creating lo, uh, dependencies for managing dependencies of project. MPX is is downloading one package and running it immediately without saving it uh, in our project. So it's sort of a run once. Uh, uh, script. And the script name is called create react app. 
create react application and we give it one parameter which is the name of the application itself demo this instruction will create a subfolder called subdirectory called demo below the current one we'll create a packet.json and we'll download a long list of dependencies okay so and we we'll configure several packages so it will take uh, some time and some megabytes of downloading of course we only need to do this the first time and then we have a, a, a project which is ready to run. Uh, of course, we need to wait until it's finished. And uh, if we are doing the same thing at the same time, right now, I can understand that the network is doing its best. OK. It's done. So inside our week six, we have a demo uh, directory that contains our project. We see that if we ever look at the package.json file, it's uh, using some libraries that were already uh, downloaded for us and define some scripts uh, that we may run for executing the program. Uh, the real application is split into two directories. Or we see the node modules here with all the packages that have been downloaded in this time, in these 200 megabytes and so. Some of these uh, modules are really needed for running the React application, and most, but most of them are just uh, needed in development mode. OK, so we see the dependencies um, are uh, somewhere Okay, there are some, okay, don't see it. Uh, there are some dependencies just for uh, development and uh, some other for um, running. When we build a project, we will only, uh, say, conserve or retain the um, runtime dependencies. But it's a more advanced topic. The application is split into two directories, public and source. Um, Public contains uh, basically static files. Contains an, an index.html file, which is the container of the application that we usually don't touch. If we look at the index that has been created, it's basically an empty index. There's some metadata at the beginning, uh, a body with a one element inside, which is the root element. So it's an empty HTML page with just a div container they will be the container of the real application. We are normally not using, not touching this file. Then we have, uh, so this is the static content. We can put icons, images in this folder, and they will be accessible to our application. But these are just static files that will be uh, downloaded to the browser. They cannot contain any JavaScript code. All JavaScript code will be inside the source directory. And in particular, we have an index.js file that is automatically called from the index.html file. And it contains one instruction, basically, the render method. So which is what puts the app component inside the root node, the div ID equal to root that we saw in the index.html. So index.html contains an, a div with ID root. Index.js is a JavaScript which is being run inside the index and will contain a render call. So we start the application starting from the component called app uh, and injecting this component into this uh, uh, element with ID equal to Normally, we don't need to touch this file. Okay. All our work will be inside 
the application, the app component. That is in the app.js file. And we see that this app.js file is, contains just a function, app, with a return statement that will return some fragment of uh, JSX. So Java, uh, JSX uh, is the HTML-like uh, syntax for creating this set of nodes. And this is basically a static component. We return always, every time we call this function, we return exactly the same code. Okay? And this is our starting point. We, are st we will start by deleting this code and start writing our own. Okay? Uh, but before changing it, let's try to run it. Running it means uh, doing an npm start. Oh, by the way, we cannot load this JavaScript directly into the browser because the browser doesn't understand JSX, for example. So the real JavaScript that, is, that will be loaded by the browser will be a transformation of this code. This transformation happens automatically. In development mode, it will happen in real time on the fly. And in production mode, it will be translated at the beginning and then saved in a JavaScript bundle, one big file that bundles everything together after the translation steps. Hmm? We don't see any of that explicitly. npm start. Uh, no, sorry, npm, yeah. No, I, I must go into the demo sorry, folder. And then I run npm start. Start will start a web browser, sorry, a web server, uh, which is called the React Development Server. And we'll, up, we'll open a browser window. So the server, the React Development Server, usually runs on port 3000 on localhost by default. And so we are running this server. The, uh, the server will uh, start and transform all the JavaScript code into all this React code into the real JavaScript code, open the browser, and uh, the server here is keep, keeps running. And there's a nice functionality of uh, automatically updating the code. So whenever we, if the server is still running, whenever we modify some code, there in JavaScript, and we save it, uh, the server notices that and updates the, the browser immediately. So we have a very fast development uh, environment. Okay? Um, and uh, we have the possible syntax errors that are shown here, but are also translated to the browser. So there are very nice integration in development mode between the server and the browser. So this is the content of this uh, app.js file. That's it's telling us if you edit app.js, save and reload, and see what happens. So uh, this is just uh, this logo, this image here. If you don't like this image, you just throw it away and save the file. And uh, it's gone. What happened is that you updated the file. And the uh, uh, server noticed the change and informed the front-end application that something needs to be updated. Usually, we are running always with the inspector open because the console will uh, always keep an eye on the warning, on the errors on the console. In this case, if, if I reload this application, okay, we see I see a warning here. Uh, this warning, we shouldn't care about this, this specific warning because it's part of the transition from React 17 to 18. It's because create React app still creates the skeleton of a React 17 project. It uses the older React, uh, the older render function, the older render syntax. So we could modify it if, you, if we want into the index of JS, uh, but mostly we, we need not care. We know that. In a couple of weeks, probably, React React App, React App will uh, use the new syntax, and but nothing else will change for us. But any other uh, errors or warnings, uh, 
uh, usually are also shown in the console here. Okay, so maybe they're printed in the console of the server, but also trans trans uh, say, transported and translated into the console of the uh, of the browser. Hmm? Okay, what can we do in this context? Well, uh, we could try to experiment uh, creating a different interface. Uh, Mm. Maybe we want to create a, a button to, to be pressed, okay? Instead of just a, a, a title. So, for create, if I want to create a button, imagine we want to create three buttons into my page with different titles, with different contents. So, we could do here a button, insert a button element, and then a second one, and then the third one directly in the HTML code. But since I'm repeating some part of the page, it would be wiser to create one component that will render the button as I like it, and call this component three times. Okay? So, uh, let's get rid of most of the code here. Okay? Oh, sorry, and return maybe just the demo buttons, a title. Let's see. Okay, right now is we are we are we have a very raw page. And we want to insert. Uh, some new component uh, inside uh, this page, which is a button. So we can create a component as a normal new file. We call it my button. Yes. Define the component is as simple as defining a function. So function my button. In general, a function receives a set of properties. We don't have any, or oh, we may have some props. And it returns a fragment of code. A fragment of code which normally we write, sorry, we write in, uh, um, in JSX. So in this case, it would be a button, a normal HTML button with some high text in, uh, on it. Okay, we can define the function with any of the syntax defining function, also as an arrow, as an expression, as a function statement. I tend to write function statement because they are more visible, but mm, they, they don't make any difference. So, if I, I want, so this is my component. It's already a full <laughs> React component. If I want to use this component inside my code, inside the application, the component is called my button, and I should use it here. My button. Since we, have, we don't have any content, it doesn't contain any children, we close the tag immediately. And in this way, we are calling the component itself. There are still two details. One is that uh, this uh, name, my button, is undefined here. And the second is that the return statement should return one value. And now we are returning, we have the syntax wrong, because there's one value here space uh, another value there so it's not it's not remember these are just syntax for creating objects so it's like it, it's like you are you throw you were trying to return one object uh, a equal to three and followed by another object b equal to seven or whatever it doesn't work okay so we need to be to ensure that we are returning only one element. 
So if we need to return two, we just rob them into something, maybe a div. So that the return from a syntactical point of view is returning just one div that contains other stuff. And then my button is not defined, and it's quite true, because it's not defined in this file. For uh, enabling one function to access the um, variables or functions, the names defined in another module, we may use an, a mechanism for importing and exporting names across modules. So in the browser, we are not using the require syntax uh, that we were used to in, in Node.js. We are using the standard syntax, uh, which is based on the, on the import and export statements. So this myButton.js should export the function myButton so that it may be used from outside the module. Otherwise, the name will be private to the module. If we are only exporting one name, we use the, we'll see some detail, more detail, but let's now just, let's try, try to be practical. If we only have one name to export, uh, it's the default export, uh, default of the module, my button. That's it. This tells that to everybody who is importing this module, that they may access this function, this name, that happens to map to a function. And in the application, I need to import my button from, okay, the file my button. So this was automatically completed by, by VS Code, but uh, this is the import statement. Import a name from a, a module file. Uh, the modules normally, we may import names from uh, library modules or from my own modules in my project. If they are in my project, usually we need the path, dot slash, in the current directory. If we don't have any path here, we are loading from node modules, from the, the library dependencies. Okay, so if we, are, if we are importing something from a library, normally here you have the name of the library. If we are importing something from our own code, we have the local path of starting with the dot for the current directory. So right now my button is not undefined anymore because I imported that name from that file. If I say the application, and switch the browser, I see a very small button called high in the corner there. And so this is a button that I can click and it will do nothing because I don't have any event tender register to that. And if I want more of these buttons, I can instantiate many more. And I can play all the day with these buttons. When I save, I will have three buttons in a row. Of course, they are identical. I don't, I don't need to make them identical. If I want to change this button, so change the text that we have in this button, I should still use the uh, button, my button component, uh, but I need to have an argument, a parameter, a property the specified, the text, or maybe the color, or the size, or whatever I want to change in this button. So adding a property is very simple because I just add, decide what property I want to man, uh, have. For example, text. Text. This is just a name that they give. And the value will be hi. The second We'll have a different text. The value will be hello. 
and the third one will be no in Italian text equal to uh, ciao. So passing a property to a component is as simple as setting an attribute into the JSX syntax of the component itself. Of course, when I set in this uh, property, nothing changes yet. Because we still have to instruct the button to use this information. And this information is available in the properties. So all the attributes, all the properties that we are passing to a component, uh, they are available inside this props object. Props is an object that contains many properties according to what has been passed. So in this case, uh, it's uh, uh, cause the message is uh, in props uh, dot props uh, dot uh, text. But text uh, is the name of the attribute that they used in the caller. If we want to check it, we may add some login function. We are still not putting that into the button, okay? But if I save this, I should see that in the console that uh, when let's reload the application. H hi, hello, ciao. These are the three messages that have been logged to the console uh, when React has rendered the first button, rendered the second button, and rendered the third button. Okay. Um, you see that they are printed twice uh, because React is running in development mode, is, is running the component twice. We, we don't have control over when and how many times a component is rendered. As long as it's still returning the same information. Okay, of course we don't need, we don't want to, except for debugging purposes, to write anything on the console, because that this message should be inside the button. I can write message here, because that would be taken as a string content. Okay, like I had, I had high before, now I would print message in the button. I, I must have a syntax uh, for specifying that a part uh, of this JSX uh, should contain the result of a JavaScript expression. And this can be done with this braces syntax. So if we put inside the JSX expression, we open braces, we are entering the JavaScript mode in which the expression will be evaluated and the result of the expression will be inserted into that point of the Java of the JSX expression. So if I save it, I see now that I have three buttons with different text on those. So the same component rendered in a different way according to the properties, to the props it just received. Right now, it's just a simple button HTML tag, but they could transform it into anything fancier, and the applic the app JS would not notice that. We only call one component with some properties. How this component is rendered, how it works, how it is displayed, is just a matter of the component itself. Um, in the inspector, if we have installed the React Developer Tools, we have some further a new view, which is called Components, with the, I, or the React icon, that will let me inspect the structure of the application from the point of view of components. Because, of course, this page is still an HTML page. Uh, this 
div which was empty is now filled with uh, this content because React is actually populating the DOM, of course. But seeing the DOM may be a too a low level view if, we, if our components are complex or do, doing a lot of stuff. So what we are seeing here is the end result of the execution of React. If we want to have a look on the structure of the application, we can go to the component view that will remember which components uh, were part of the page. And for example, in this second button, it will tell me that this button has some proper uh, properties, text uh, called hello, and is rendered by app, but it's father component. And where the call for that component is. So for every component we'll, in the inspector, we have some information about the properties, the state, when we left the state, and so on. And we can inspect uh, at the high level, at the, at the React level, what is going on. Hmm? And it will be give me the source uh, inside uh, my project code. App.js is not available in the browser because it's been, it's, it's been transformed, we know. It's only available in our project, and we, it's telling us where. Hmm? So we, we may both see and check the DOM for debugging the, the end result, but also see and, uh, and debug the component tree. Every component, we know where it was called and what, which properties they were given to him, to it. So this is the basic working. We can create any type of, uh, of HTML structure with just this mechanism. The properties are useful for replicating a similar part of content with different values. So if we have our you know, table with the exams, uh, we can customize it uh, uh, with, with the different rows. Hmm? So mostly we need to, in the focus of this week, is to reason on the general application structure and uh, the flow of properties from top to bottom. This now, this is a very simple example. We'll try to uh, do a more complex example with our uh, exercise with the exam scores and try to move it into, into React. For doing that, uh, we only need, uh, so these, these slides are basically contained information that we already saw out in the project, we, here we have a one-page summary of uh, export and import and import statements, uh, which we need uh, uh, to be able to, uh, to split our project into several files. So if we have uh, <clears throat> just uh, one function or one name defined in a module, we just may export default, uh, and we, can, we have the corresponding import statement. If a module file defines many different functions. You, you may have one single file in which you define five components, for example. So you need to export more than one name from a module. And you just, instead of exporting a default value, you export an object, a list of, of names. And of course, when you are importing, you specify in the braces which names you want to import, if not all of them, just only some of them. So you can export just one name or an object that contains uh, as a property a, a, a list of names. Mm. It's just a, uh, a very simple syntax. Uh, let's work. Okay, we, we are not, we are not changing. We'll keep this example of the buttons, but uh, next week we are adding the state when we are uh, seeing. Um, from the style point of view, uh, right now we are working on, on bare HTML, but uh, since we uh, probably want to make a more nicer, or more complete uh, uh, interface, and we learned Bootstrap in the previous weeks, uh, I just mentioned that there is a module which is called React Bootstrap that defines a set of React components that correspond mostly to the different Bootstrap classes. So we know that we have a class uh, uh, with uh, contain called container. We, we wrote div I, uh, class equal to container. It contains a div class equal to row. 
that contain a class and so on, uh, div, um, div with class equal to column and so on. And uh, if we are using this uh, React Booster library, we have these components that will translate into the corresponding Booster column, which is very, if we, since we are already a bit familiar with Bootstrap, it's quite convenient to do that. So what does it mean? It means that we are going to add some extra dependencies, some extra library to our project. And we may access those components. Uh, for doing that, we must install into our project two libraries. The first one is the, actually the React Bootstrap library with, that defines the React components. And the second Bootstrap is that the CSS for the Bootstrap library itself. So the React component, of course, will create a DOM component that will use the, the booster classes. It's just a convenience for us. We, I used it as an example to show how to add new packages or add new libraries to our project. I need to stop the server. Control C should work. And right now, I am in the project directory. I can install bootstrap it's a normal npm command it's installing and npm install react dash bootstrap bootstrap okay right now they have been no. Add it to the to the packet.json and add it to the download into node modules so I can use them in my project. For example, instead of having a simple div here, I, I could use a container with two rows. For example, the first row is the title and the second row will contain the, the buttons. So uh, container. Slash container. That is the component that corresponds to the bootstrap container. Of course, uh, the, it doesn't know the container name because uh, I need to import it. Import container from React Bootstrap. So here we've seen two details. One, uh, importing from a library. You see there is no dot slash because it will search. Since we are not given an explicit path, it will search inside node modules. And since this library defines a lot of components, uh, we are selecting only those components that we need. After a while, VS Code will understand the library that we are using in our project and will uh, offer auto-completion, auto-importing auto of the components. But at the, at the beginning, it doesn't know. Hmm? So we need to, at the first time, we need to import it explicitly. Then it will understand. And so also in, in this container following the um, bootstrap structure of a page, I can add two rows. Uh, and the one column each, you see that when, when you wrote row, VS Code already understood that it can be imported from React Bootstrap. And so I can just say enter, and the row has been added to the import statement. And this row may contain one column that uh, is from React Bootstrap that contains just the title. And then we have a second row with one column that hosts my three buttons. Okay. Right now, it doesn't do very much 
if I wrote the application, sorry, it's not start, start and PM start. You see that when the application starts, it takes a while because it's now recompiling all our JSX into real JavaScript. Okay, I say it doesn't do very much. It's not very much different from, from the previous version because right now we are actually generating the class equal to container, class equal to row, and so on, all the, all the booster classes. But we didn't import the, Java, the, the bootstrap CSS yet. But so we are only using components that will generate uh, correct uh, HTML code, assuming that the bootstrap CSS is loaded. Right now it's not loaded, but we, uh, we may see it on the, there's a website for React Bootstrap. Just search for React Bootstrap, you find this website, uh, and it will tell you that you should have this import statement here in your application so that the CSS files are loaded inside the browser. We don't use, we, may, we might use the, sta, uh, the, um, the link uh, statement in the um, head section of the index.html, but usually so we don't modify the index.html. We can use a, a CSS is able to transform an import and uh, understand whether we are importing a JavaScript file, whether we are importing an image file, whether we are importing a CSS file, and we'll put it correctly in the right place in the, in the DOM. So for us, it's a high level function. We want to import into our application the CSS for Bootstrap. And you see that we are loading the file from uh, Bootstrap, dist, CSS, and so on. So we are loading this file from inside the node modules directory. And uh, the packager inside React will make a copy of this file and send it to the browser together with the JavaScript. So it's a lot of complexity that we don't, that we don't, need, we don't need to see. So we save it, it will be recompiled. And if we go to the browser, it should look different. They are still ugly, but uh, they are different. So we, the, we see that the fonts of the title and so on, and the, the margins are now decided by the boost of containers. Of course, we, we, we may want to make the buttons uh, nicer by using the boost of classes, also for the buttons. So we go and we change the uh, my button. And say, okay, I also want to use, I don't want to use the button low level HTML element. I want to use a, a button element from React Bootstrap. And slash button. Of course, all the components uh, or the classes defined in Bootstrap are available as React components. Uh, and if you don't want to guess, uh, we have this list of components here that gives you uh, basically. Here in the last, this is not the bootstrap documentation, it's the React bootstrap documentation that will tell you about the components that you may use in your application. As a general rule, all the classes in bootstrap uh, are converted into a React component. Hmm? Uh, so we can use the button imported from React bootstrap. Of course, we need to import uh, the component in every file that we are using. So every file should have the imports for the component that we need. Every module, every file is a self-contained entity. It must import all the names that it will use. I save it. And if I go to the application, OK, these are now boot buttons styled with the bootstrap styles and so on. So it's easy to use component libraries from outside. Of course, you need to follow the instruction for integrating the library. But then you use the components uh, as your own. Of course, our application has become more complex uh, because if I have a look at the components, uh, right now there are much, OK, that we have a container, we have a row, column, 
row, column, my button, button, and my button, button inside. So, but the button is still a component that will generate HTML. And we see that this button is coming from a render by uh, my button and so on. We have some properties and so on. And if we want to change uh, the color or the style of the, we see that uh, um, we have the possible properties defined for this object, uh, which are documented uh, in the, sorry, in the uh, React Bootstrap site. So for example, if you want to, if you wanted to change the color or the style of the button, we can have the example using the variant property. Okay, in uh, basic bootstrap, we will write class equal to button, btn, space, btn primary, or btn success, and so on. Here, we are just using the button class uh, with a property, which is called variant, <coughs> and, uh, and so on. So there are other type of variants that we can use. Uh, and it will just change the way in which the component will render itself. Rendering itself means generating the corresponding HTML file. Uh, by the way, we, are, we have now an example of uh, one component that is not generating, or two components, that both of them are not generating any real HTML. This one is only rendering another component. So by rendering my button, I will render another component that will render, maybe we don't know, real HTML. And also the app, we are, when we are rendering the app, I'm rendering a tree of uh, component, many components, and none of them are real HTML components except this one. It's normal. We, can, we may mix uh, React components and HTML elements as we want to create one, one big tree. And React will know which functions to call. And of course, we'll keep calling these functions until at the end we only have HTML left. At the end, the page will only contain HTML nodes. Hmm? So we should, will not go on. Uh, but normally, uh, we have a lot of, most of the code will be components that include, that render other components and so on, and change in properties uh, in this way. Okay, uh, still have a couple of details I want to mention. Or maybe we can, we can stop uh, now. So what I want to mention, in the, uh, what I would like to do in the next hour, is to try to understand a bit more about uh, some rules uh, about the, uh, the, especially the syntax of JSX, what we, what we may do, so that we are more say, familiar with the syntax, and uh, use this for um, trying to recreate uh, our table with the scores of the courses in React this time. Okay, so we we'll start from the same code where we have a JavaScript object that we take from the previous weeks. A JavaScript object contains all the information. And we uh, use this information and try to understand how to transform that into properties that go uh, to the right component. So this is what we are trying to do in next hour. Understand a little bit of details about the JavaScript syntax and try to apply it to our exercise. Let's try to, to do that. Okay. So if you want, uh, we, we may have a, a break of 15 minutes or so. And if you want, you could uh, create, uh, uh, launch the creation of another project so that we don't have to wait uh, the NPM creator at app uh, with the name, I don't know, exams or something like that. So that while we are doing the break, uh, NPM is downloading and installing everything. Okay.